Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie zu Episode Nummer 19 von Schwarze Katze Theologie. Ich bin Herr Dr. Peter Dillard und heute sollten wir unser Gespräch über die Verbindung zwischen der Philosophie von Martin Heidegger und zeitgenössischen Theologie fortführen. Hello everybody, this is Dr. Peter Dillard. Welcome to Episode 19 of Black Cat Theology. Currently, we are in the course of examining connections between Heidegger's understanding of this radically non-metaphysical way of thinking and being he seeks to to describe and to he hopes that will happen and his political engagement not only in 1933 but in the years after that remember that last time we were looking at this philosophy he sketches in the 1933 entries from the Schwarze Heft of the Black Notebooks and in these entries Heidegger is explicitly thinking about the Nazi state, where there is a leader, or der Führer, and there is a people, das Volk, and the question Heidegger poses to himself is, well, in virtue of what is it the case that the leader and the people are worthy to possess and to exercise power? Now, his answer to that is thoroughly non-metaphysical. Because when he's thinking about when the leader is giving the people an assignment that they need to fulfill, there's nothing external somewhere out there in a platonic heaven or third realm or some kind of abstract norm or auftrag that determines whether or not the people and the leader are worthy to possess and exercise power. That is solely determined within the sphere of this communal action. So, for example... If the leader throws the people an Auftrag, or an assignment, and they catch it in a skillful or geschmeidy way, so that they execute, execute it very skillfully, then, and only then, are we entitled to say that the leader and the people have proven worthy uh, to possess and, and exercise power. There's nothing outside of them that solves that question, or answers it. It's only within the context of this communal action. And if that goes on over a protracted length of time, then we have even more justification to say, according to Heidegger in 33, that the leader and the people have proven worthy to possess and exercise power. Now, what I want to do today is look at Heidegger's other ways of characterizing this non-metaphysical event of being after 1933. In other words, I want to look at texts in after 33 into the mid 30s and on into the 40s because on the surface he his characterization of this non-metaphysical event in the later texts is quite different from the way he sketches it in 1933 and so we might think that well maybe this later view escapes the problems that we pointed out with the earlier view last time we, we might in other words maybe maybe he's made some kind of philosophical progress there that will enable him to avoid these objections what I want to argue today is that is not the case. I want to say, and will argue, that despite the rhetorical differences between Heidegger's later characterizations of non-metaphysical being and his view in 1933, which is also non-metaphysical, the same fundamental problem applies to both. So we want to get to that today. Now, let's begin by looking at some of these passages from Heidegger's writings in the later 30s and on into the 40s that that rhetorically are quite different from those 1933 entries in the Schwarze Hefte. So let's begin with some of his remarks from the uh, in the Beiträge zur Philosophie, the Contributions to Philosophy, where this is basically the middle and late 30s. And this is after the failure of his rectorship. You know, he was rector of Freiburg University for approximately a year from 33 to 34, and then he became very disenchanted because he could not see how to promote this synthesis between the non-metaphysical thinking that he was describing and the political forces in Germany at the time. That was He, he had not seen a way to do that, and so he gave up the rectorate and he became more reflective. So this is the period we're talking about now in the Beiträge. And here's how he talks about non-metaphysical being, this non-metaphysical way of thinking and being in that text. 
Let me just read a, a few passages here. He says at one point, What we, steadfast in design, ground and create, and in creating, allow to advance toward us in the manner of an assault, only that can be something true and manifest, and consequently recognized and known. Our knowledge extends only as far as the steadfastness in Dasein reaches out, and there is the power of sheltering the truth in configured beings. So notice here that the rhetoric is very different. There's no talk of assignments or Aufträge and the Führer and the people and this kind of collective action uh, of being thrown an assignment and trying to, to execute it in a skillful or geschmeidy way. Now we're talking, it's like Dasein is almost exposed. It's vulnerable. It's out in a clearing where it's exposed to the, the storm of being or being is, as he says here, an assault. And Dasein needs to withstand that. He needs to weather the assault in the hope that at some point this power, this non-metaphysical way of sheltering beings in a radically non-metaphysical way, that that will emerge. And so here the rhetoric is that of vulnerability, exposure, danger even. Let's look at a couple of other passages from the, the Beitrega. The intimacy of being has wrath as its essence, and the strife is always at the same time confusion. Both can always be lost in the wasteland of indifference and forgottenness. Or elsewhere in the same text, he says, every projection is storm, felicity, verb, movement. Every carrying out is serenity, persistence, renunciation. So once again, here in these later descriptions of this possible non-metaphysical advent, what we have is a, an emphasis upon human vulnerability, uh, being exposed to being as something wrathful or as like a storm that we have to endure, and in the hopes that eventually this new non-metaphysical era will dawn. And so we could almost think about Heidegger himself in his little cabin, a Hütte, near Totnalberg, which is on the hillside, and is exposed to the great expanse of, you know, the Black Forest and the mountains in the vicinity there. It's a beautiful place. And so Heidegger has established this little outpost, if you will, where he's sort of hunkering down and he wants to wait out the storm in the hopes that eventually the weather will clear and the sun will come out. And he's thinking about him, his own philosophical activity in a very similar way, where he's sort of remaining steadfast in the hopes that the metaphysical clouds will part, if you will, and this radically non-metaphysical light or way of thinking will begin to emerge. So again, the emphasis is upon waiting, vulnerability, uh, being exposed to these metaphysical or non-metaphysical forces, as the case may be. That, that comes out in the later text. Now, the next thing that I would like to observe is that the way Heidegger talks about Dasein here in these texts, in, from the Beiträge and even in the Letter on Humanism, which was the, 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 well, actually, I didn't read the Letter on Humanism. Let me go back to that. This is another thing, text from 1947. And here Heidegger says, the human being is and is human insofar as he is the existing one. This is a neologism, and he says E-K hyphen S-I-S-T-I-N-G. It's like standing out in the clearing. He, that is the human being, stands out into the openness of being. Being itself, which as the throw, has projected the essence of the human being into care, and it is this opening. Thrown in such a fashion, the human being stands in the openness of being. So once again, here we have this rhetoric of standing in the openness, standing in the clearing, waiting, trying to withstand and endure the elements or the very the difficulties that have arisen in the philosophical situation in the hopes that eventually this non-metaphysical clarity will break out and, and, and this radically new non-metaphysical era will be ushered in. Now, as I was saying just a second ago, when Heidegger talks about Dasein here and also in the letter on humanism and also in those passages from the Beiträge, the contributions to philosophy that I read, um, he's using Dasein here in a very different way from that in which he uses the term in sign und Zeit. In sign und Zeit, Dasein is simply human being per se, along with its various ontological structures, or what Heidegger calls existential, existentials, such as 
being towards death, uh, also everyday circumspection, fallenness, and so forth, and also the sort of underlying ecstatic temporality of past, present, and future that he thinks is, is intrinsic to Dasein. That's, that's what he's talking about, and that's how he uses the term Dasein in, uh, Dasein in Sein und Zeit. Now, in the later text, though, Dasein is no longer a term for a human being in general or per se. Dasein is a style of being human. It's a way of being human depending on what the situation is. And in the Beiträge zur Philosophie, Heidegger describes at least three different styles of Dasein. The first one he refers to as total forgetfulness of being. And this is the style of Dasein that we find throughout much of contemporary life, according to Heidegger. Where here, Dasein is no longer occupied by the question of being, the Seinsfrage. To the point it's forgotten it, not only has it forgotten it, it's even proceeded to the point where it's forgotten that it, it's forgotten it. It's completely lost, has absolutely no awareness of the significance of this question. Part of that, Heidegger thinks, is because uh, is due to metaphysics, where metaphysics treats being as the maximally general characteristic that's common to all and only beings, to the point that it gets watered down in the, over the course of the history of Western philosophy, and eventually becomes just an abstraction, something completely empty and devoid of content, to the point that we forget all about it, because it's so bland and uninteresting. And we go on to forget about the fact that we've forgotten all about it. That kind of forgetfulness is endemic, Heidegger thinks, to contemporary human existence. That's the style of being human today. And it's also uh, characterized by what he calls the onslaught of global technology, where everything is treated almost just as a knee-jerk reaction, without even thinking about it, everything is treated as a product for consumption, as what he calls standing reserve, whether we're talking about trees or animals or, or waterways, rivers, oceans, or people, they're resources. And so we sort of just unreflexively, or unreflectively get into this, reflexively and unreflectively take on this way of the style of being Dasein, and that's what Heidegger thinks is going on throughout much of contemporary life. But there's another. The second style is rather different from that. It's what he calls shocked and diffident restraint. So the shock is when somebody begins to become aware, once again, of the Seinsfrage. And it might happen, for example, when somebody is struck by the thought, well, why is there something rather than nothing? Certainly, it could have been the case that, you know, there might never have been anything. There might have just been a state of absolute nothingness and nothing might ever have existed. But in fact, we see that there is a world full of these various beings and it's contingent. And so we might be struck by that fact. And in this questioning, we are thematizing or becoming aware of being once again. Now, we're still, though, confused. We don't know how to make progress on this question. And so there's a kind of humility before that, that Heidegger refers to as diffidence. And there's also a kind of restraint then. In other words, we don't rush ahead because we don't know how to make clarity on this question. We don't even know what tools we should be using to do that. So instead of rushing ahead it, you know, into unknown ground or simply uh, going back to things that have been said before, we are restrained. We wait, and there's a kind of stoicism there that Heidegger talks about. So that's a second style of being Dasein, where Dasein begins to awaken from its metaphysical slumber, if you will, but still hasn't quite made it to this post-metaphysical way of existing or being in the world. But that's the third style of Dasein, the preferred style of Dasein that Heidegger talks about in the Beiträge. And that's what he calls Dasein as preserving and seeking stewardship where Dasein preserves the beings, uh, the beings around it. It preserves the world, and the, which consists of these various beings. It also is, not only in, does it do that in ways that, that have happened before, but it may seek you know, new ways of doing that, perhaps in works of art, or in deeds, or in poetry. And when those two things come together, 
it, it's, a, it's a style of being human here in this radically post-metaphysical world, if you will, is a kind of stewardship. Now, a couple of other things I want to say about this understanding of Dasein that Heidegger has in these later writings. He thinks that these styles are all, all, all ways of filling in what he calls the basic disposition. So the basic and and the basic disposition is characterized, according to Heidegger, by a kind of temporality. So in each of the three styles that I just described, the dimensions of past, present, and future come together, and specifically the past and the future come together to determine a certain present. So when we're talking about total forgetfulness, well, the forgetting you can't forget something unless you at some point had an inkling of it. So that has to do with the past, and but then to the point where you no longer, you even forget that you've forgotten it, and you sort of move into this, this kind of brave new world, this future in which technology is t totally dominant, and we sort of are reflexively and unreflectively approaching things simply as resources for our own consumption, which here I think Heidegger is being quite prescient because that is largely true of modern consumerism. So... We don't think about it anymore, and we continue indefinitely into the future simply as producers, and that gives rise to this kind of forgetfulness, that, the, the present of being, well, just in a state of total forgetfulness. In the second style of being Dasein, when we're shocked about being, and so we begin to recover uh, some initial sense or inkling of the science thraga, the, the question of being, that obviously is a return to something that happened in the past in a different way, but we are picking up a part of our tradition, so that pertains to the past, but we also don't forge ahead. We're, we're, we're humble, and we don't forge ahead, yet we sort of wait. We wait for the future to unfold that will hopefully give us ways of pursuing and clarifying that question that are non-metaphysical, so there's a future component, and together they give rise to the distinctive present of this style of being Dasein, which is a kind of restraint or stoic waiting. All right? Finally, in the preferred non-metaphysical way of being Dasein, the style of Dasein, the preserving, when you preserve something, that's taking it over from the past, so we're preserving beings in ways that we have done often before, but we're also looking to new ways to do that in language and deed and art. And so we're looking to the future, and that those two dimensions together give rise to that very definite present, which is a, being a steward, or as Heidegger calls it in the letter on humanism, Dasein is the shepherd of being. That's what he hopes it will become, but it's not there yet. So there's this temporality of the basic disposition that comes through in these various styles of being Dasein. Now, let's proceed to the philosophical evaluation. As I said at the beginning of the lecture, Prima facie, it looks like the view that Heidegger is describing here in these writings like the, Beit the Beiträge zur Philosophie and the Letter on Humanism after 1933 and on into the 40s is very different from the Nazi philosophy, non-metaphysical philosophy that he sketches in 1933 in those entries from the Schwarze Hefte. But I think that this is misleading. Yes, rhetorically there's a difference here because in the 1933 philosophy, there's a lot of talk about the Führer and the people and the Auftrag and this sort of catching it and fulfilling it. And so it looks like there is this sort of emphasis upon the will and the, not only of the leader, but also of the people. And together that create, is going on in the Nazi state. Whereas later things are more passive. It's, it's that Dasein needs to be present. It needs to be there in the clearing, waiting. So it needs to be engaged. But it cannot totally control or orchestrate or engineer this possible future advent of a, non, a radically non-metaphysical way of being in the world. It has to wait. Waiting is a kind of agency, but we cannot determine the outcome, the non-metaphysical outcome. We have to wait for it. So that seems very different from what, what, what Heidegger was saying in 1933, at least on the surface. And it's important for Heidegger's purposes, too, because it draws a very stark contrast between the possible advent of this radically non-metaphysical way of being in the world and modern technology where we 
basically seek to control everything. We treat everything as a means to our own ends. So we're trying to engineer and orchestrate and pull the strings of everything. And the non-metaphysical way of thinking is totally opposed to that. Now, rhetorically, there is a difference between what Heidegger is saying in 33 and later, in the mid-30s and on into the 40s. But philosophically, the same problem is there. Because let's go back to the view from 1933. What we're going to see is that that would be that would be perfectly philosophically compatible with the kind of passivity, if you will, that Heidegger talks about later. Because remember, the leader and the people, when when the leader throws the people an assignment or an Auftrag and they catch it and they do it in a geschmeidig or skillful way, that is not something that is entirely engineered or controlled or orchestrated by the leader or the people. Yes, they have to be engaged. Yes, the leader has to throw the Auftrag. Yes, the people have to, to catch it and try to implement it, hopefully in a geschmeidig way, but they cannot determine that outcome by themselves. There has, there's, a, there's a, an element of the fortuitous there. <clears throat> Whether things work out in a geschmeidig way is not completely under the control of the Nazi leader or the Nazi folk. It's simply something that happens. So let's go back to one of the examples that I used last time. If we're talking, if the if the Auftrag that the leader gives the people is to, you know, let's have infrastructure improvements. In, in, we're going to redo all the infrastructure in the nation and have it done within the next three years, and half the people are go, are assigned to the the uh, squad that takes care of the bridges, and the other half are assigned to the squad that takes care of the roads, and it, then the squad that's working on the the bridge winds up with some extra stones, and lo and behold, it turns out that that's exactly the amount that the people who are working, the squad that's working on the roads needs in order to complete that. Okay, that's a fortuitous outcome. That's not something that the leader and the people planned or engineered. It just was a happy outcome. And so even in 1933, despite the rhetorical differences between that position and what Heidegger says later, there it, it, we also, Dasein, or the people, Dasein in the form of the leader and the people in the Nazi state, they also have to be, they're not completely in control of things. They also are vulnerable or exposed to the fortuitous. Or if the Nazi leader gives the people the assignment that well, we're going to conquer the European continent and subject it to Nazi rule. Now, they might do that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they did not, thank God, but they might have done that. Suppose that they had, and suppose that they had done it in a geschmeidig way, so that, that the swastika was flying over every European capital now. Still, in any military campaign, no matter how well it's planned and executed, there, is always things, there are always things beyond the control of the leader and the people, or of the military forces. So there's always a degree of the fortuitous, there's always a degree of chance, and so the people and the leader would have to be aware of that, and if, it, and if, it, if they do fulfill that Auftrag, it, it's not simply through their own determination of that. They cannot guarantee the outcome. Now what this means is that whether we're talking about the view in 1933 or the one later, in both cases, Dasein, whether it's the leader and the people or it's this, this style of being human, the different style of being human that Heidegger talks about, there is a kind of vulnerability, a kind of passivity, where not everything is under the control of Dasein. And so even, let's go to the view that comes out later, in the, you know, in the later 30s and in the 40s. You know, it's certainly possible that Dasein could wait for this metaphysical, not this radically non-metaphysical way of being in the world to, to unfold through it. And that might even happen, but it could do so in very problematic ways. It could do so in ways in which, well, look, um, what happens is that Dasein begins to persecute anyone who holds metaphysical views, the objective, or to be very, very tolerant, maybe books are burned, with the, again, where this is part of the process of this non-metaphysical way of being in the world to uh, its emergence, that could happen through Dasein. But once again, Dasein cannot guarantee, we cannot guarantee that 
every metaphysical text will be extirpated, or that every metaphysical professor on the faculty will get fired, or that everything will go our way. All we can do is sort of be there and be engaged, but the outcome is not totally under our control. That's just like the view from 1933. So my point is that I don't see any fundamental philosophical difference between the, the way that Heidegger characterizes the non-metaphysical event in the Nazi view of 1933 and the other way that he or the ways that he describes it in writings after that. Now, that's all I want to say for today. I want to give a quite a, a slight foreshadowing to the of uh, the next lecture. We've seen that in order to avoid these kinds of problems, there needs to be something beyond the non-metaphysical event of being that will guide it in positive ways not in and, and will shunt it away from negative ways, negative aufträge, ne, aufträge negative uh, ways of being non-metaphysical. So this is what we have been referring to as the holy. And the holy is not some platonic object, but it is something that we experience. And we've been talking about how our experience of the holy can guide our individual and collective action in ways that are consonant with the holy. That is, in ways that are productive and positive and nourishing, fulfilling, and away from ways that are destructive and damaging and harmful. But we also have to keep in mind that whether Dasein or people have been in the grip of metaphysics or not, they have already in the past created or committed grievous evils. We all have, both as individuals and as members of society, collectively as a society. And, of course, in Christianity, this is the notion of sin. So, even if we are thinking about how the Holy can guide us away from, in the future from dangerous and destructive things towards positive and wholesome ones, and holy ones, that doesn't necessarily, by itself, well, it doesn't rectify by itself the fact that in the past, things, mistakes have been made. And so, if we are going to have a full relationship with the Holy in the fullness of time and in eternity, then those things are going to have to be remedied. They're going to have to be rectified in whatever way that's possible. This, as we think about it, will take us in a more Christological direction, which we already have begun to see signs of, but that's when we need to start thinking about, you know, why did God become human? How is it that God is going to give us a remedy for sin? And how does that transpire through the suffering death and of, of Christ and his resurrection as well, which we believe as Christians? How can that give us a remedy for past evils that, that have been committed, even if whether we're in, in the grip of a metaphysical view or in the grip of some non-metaphysical? We, we've already made the transition to non-metaphysical ways of thinking. How can those past evils, those sins, be rectified. And that will bring us to the fullest sense, beginning next time at least, of why only a God can save us. We need a God who behaves in certain ways to save us from and to rectify those evils. So that's all for today. Ich wünsche Ihnen noch einen schönen Tag und uh, I will see you next time and good day.